The last of the four major figures is John Ruskin. Here is a quote. Quote, Ruskin, along with Thomas Carlyle, did more than anyone else to shape the culture of Victorian Britain, unquote. So this guy had to bring some game to the table, right? He was the only child of a well-to-do middle-class family that raised him to be a genius, and in many ways he was. He could write an argument better than almost everybody. But the problem with understanding Ruskin is that he slowly went insane, as so many child prodigies eventually do. Nonetheless, what he wrote was quite compelling and very influential in Britain at the time. He could convincingly take either side of a debate and write a winning argument. As he could naturally draw, he gravitated to painting first, and he was the first to champion the landscape paintings of J.M.W. Turner, considered by many today to be proto-impressionist in his work. That was the reason why Turner was being rejected by Britain's aristocratic cultural community. It wasn't traditional art. Ruskin was only 24 at the time when he wrote a book called Modern Painters in 1843 only two years after Pugin's publication of True Principles, in which he echoed Pugin's demand for truth in the use of materials, championing the paintings of Turner as a good example of truth. And the rest was, so to speak, art history, because Ruskin became the leading art critic in Britain after he published this book. Ruskin traveled to Italy in 1846, decided it was time to take on architecture, where he began to attack over-decoration as evidenced in Rococo architecture. He tells us to go to nature to find the truth, basically paralleling what Lager had told us. Unfortunately, his taste in architecture wasn't nearly as adventurous as was his taste for Turner's non-traditional paintings. Ruskin is known for two books on architecture. In 1849, he wrote The Seven Lamps of Architecture, you can just barely make out the names of each on this image of the cover. Sacrifice, truth, power, beauty, life, memory, and obedience. A far cry from the three that Vitruvius gave us, don't you think? Commodity, firmness, and delight. Ruskin's expanded approach to architecture can be distilled down to these talking points. First, the value of art is equal to the amount of human labor that it took to create it. There is a direct relation between the value of an object and the amount of human labor, not machine labor, that made it. Ruskin's reform idea is a reaction against the Industrial Revolution, somewhat akin to the Luddites. So Ruskin is going to completely throw out all machine-made ornament as having no value whatsoever. Second, all industrial-made work is bad. It is dishonest, he claims in The Lamp of Truth. And so what he wants to do is to return to the handicraft guilds of the medieval period. That's the reason he's championing Gothic architecture, because he is hoping that this will bring back the handicraft traditions of medieval society. Significantly, Henry Cole had just started publishing his Journal of Design, and in its October 1849 issue, Cole reviewed Ruskin's, quote, thoughtful, eloquent book, Unquote, where he focused immediately upon the issue that would forever divide these two leading personas in British design. Quote, Instead of boldly recognizing the tendencies of the age, which are inevitable, perceiving the wide distribution of certain kinds of art and the positive good that is in this, instead of considering the means of improving these tendencies and results, he, that is Ruskin, either puts up his back against their further development or would attempt to bring back the world of art to what its course was four centuries ago, as easy a thing as to put the world itself back. Our course in this 19th century may be hateful, if you please. Denounce it. But as it is our course, wise men should recognize the fact and try, by all the light God gives them, to direct it rightly. Unquote. As Pugin had forged the path to Gothic, Ruskin was ready to pick up Pugin's baton as he withered working on the Parliament building and died in 1852. But whereas Pugin wanted to reform society so as to produce an authentic Gothic architecture once again, Ruskin adopted a Luddite mentality, 
arguing to forswear the use of any industrial process or material in art by championing pre-industrial Gothic in order to restore the dignity to those who made objects, including buildings. There are three important differences between the two writers that I want to start with. Whereas Pugin was Catholic and therefore was politically suspect if for no other reason than the power structure of London was Protestant, Ruskin was a dyed-in-the-wool Protestant, so he was not at all connected with the papacy. So he could champion Gothic architecture without any popish suspicion and bring it into Britain's fashionable society. Second, Pugin was an architect. Ruskin was an art critic. So we should expect a difference in what they are looking at from a standpoint of good design. Pugin, the architect, spoke about planning a building, construction, and space, what we would call architectonics. Ruskin, the art critic, only looked at architecture as surface decoration, and so he was interested in the visual ornament on a building's surface. So a completely different way of looking at architecture between Pugin's values and what Ruskin looked at. In fact, Ruskin would tell you that it was the decoration that one added to the surface that made a building into architecture. We are back to this argument that I posed to you earlier in this series. Brunelleschi, the architect, was always talking about construction. Alberti was basically talking about elevations and ornamental systems, right? Architecture as architectonics versus architecture as ornament. Different approaches to architecture, correct? There is one other significant difference between these two Gothic advocates. Whereas Pugin wanted to copy medieval society because he thought that was the only way you could once again get an authentic Gothic architecture, that is, if you believe in this relationship between society and architecture, one couldn't get a real authentic Gothic architecture until we start to live like the Gothics. And so he first wanted to reform society that then would be able to generate authentic new Gothic architecture. Ruskin, however, is going to copy Gothic architecture in order to produce a new society. Understand the difference? Ruskin is committed to social issues. So much so that if you would ask most British socialists, their hero is not Karl Marx, but John Ruskin, especially in the formation of the Labour Party. That's the impact that Ruskin is going to have politically in Britain. Ruskin must have felt compelled to respond to the 1851 Times glowing review of the Crystal Palace. Quote, all is plain, simple, and mathematically severe. Yet who can enter that vast interior and not feel his heart swell within him at the solemn and majestic impression which it creates? Unquote. Ruskin responded, quote, mechanical ingenuity is not the essence of either painting or architecture and the largeness of dimension does not necessarily involve nobleness of design. There is assuredly as much ingenuity required to build a screw frigate or a tubular bridge as a hall of glass. All these are works characteristic of the age, and all, in their several ways, deserve our highest admiration, but not the admiration of the kind that is rendered to poetry or art. In 1853, he went to Venice, fell in love with the Venetian use of color, sky, and daylight that the city is so famous for. Remember, he had cut his teeth on Turner's paintings, and with his interest in color and painting, it shouldn't be surprising to find that he is going to champion color in architecture. He writes his next book, The Stones of Venice. He now champions Venice as having the ideal type of architecture, for he says that its architecture is the ideal mix of the three great cultures of art history, Rome, Gothic, and Islam. In other words, Ruskin is making an argument for eclecticism, that is, synthesizing pieces from different styles into a new style, versus Pugin's call for authentic replication. Ruskin says we should study and emulate Venetian Gothic architecture today. And, therefore, the best building in the world was the Doge's Palace. You can see all of the surface carving. That makes it good. Form, surface pattern, color, the play of light and shadow. This is architecture. 
he is going to argue that there is no need for a relationship between color and form. For instance, there is none in nature. Quote, explain the zebra. The stripes have no relation to the body. Unquote. So if nature can do it, so can we. The problem, unfortunately, is nobody writes better than Ruskin. He is like a chess player or a good lawyer. He anticipates the criticism some might have of his ideas, and he demolishes them in the course of his writings. By the end, you are ready to agree with him, no matter what he says, because it seems so logically written. Ruskin is excellent in crafting an argument, but I said earlier, you have to always read him carefully because he's going to go insane at some point. So you're never quite sure when he is becoming mentally unstable because he can go over the edge and still write one great argument. He states that the Doge's Palace is the best example of architecture, and for the next 20 years this building will be copied, setting off a style we call Ruskinian or Victorian Gothic, which is different than Pugin's Gothic. For instance, while there are pointed arches, the building's accent is horizontal, not vertical. Italian classical horizontal. It is also symmetric, again like Italian classical architecture. These are two of the major differences between Pugin's followers and those of Ruskin. For example, Dean and Woodward's Oxford Museum of 1854. Horizontal and symmetrical with Gothic detailing. Voila! Venetian Gothic. A very political competition between classical architects and medieval architects emerged over this commission. The board of directors decided to go with the Gothic because this building was expected to expand over time, and Gothic's ability to accept additions easier than a classical building was viewed as a plus. So Dean and Woodward were awarded the commission, and they gave us an early Gothic revival building based on Ruskinian principles. They hired two masons known for their ability to carve stone, the O'Shea brothers, but they never finished the work. The obvious conundrum of modern life versus a time required by handicraft technology. The Oxford's Exhibition Hall on the right employs glass and iron in a gothic pointed arched shape, only three years after the Crystal Palace's round arches. But I think a better comparison is Owen Jones's St. James Hall, for Jones was talking about a new design style based on solving the problem, while Ruskin was advocating imparting a style as a response to the Industrial Revolution. That same year, 1854, Ruskin took an interest in a small chapel project by Gilbert Scott, for which he made a number of suggestions. As Pugin had died the previous year, and Ruskin was quickly becoming the leading theoretician of the Gothic movement, Scott began to incorporate some of Ruskin's ideas. Some two years earlier, Scott had written a paper in which he called for the freer development of the modern Gothic, inspired by Butterfield's All Saints Margaret Street, as opposed to the Cambridge ecclesiologists who were still championing exact imitation. The most important idea for Scott was Ruskin's idea of synthetic eclecticism, that is, taking the best ideas from a number of styles and synthesizing them into a new style. Ruskin's approval of the Italian or horizontal Gothic, as manifested in Dean and Woodward's museum, also appeared in Scott's unsuccessful competition entry for a town hall in Hamburg, where his St. Nicholas Cathedral was under construction. Scott would become a leading advocate for the use of Gothic in non-ecclesiastical buildings. In 1857, Scott's entry was chosen the winner in the competition for the Foreign Office Building in Whitehall. However, during its period of design development, a national election in 1859 had changed the government, bringing in liberal Lord Palmerston as Prime Minister. Palmerston had been the rock of British foreign policy for the past two decades, although his actions had typically not ingratiated himself to either the Queen or to Albert. Palmerston had his own opinions on most issues, including architecture, and he did not like the newfangled Gothic, and demanded in 1861 that Scott revise his design to a classically styled building. It would have been a more interesting debate 
had this occurred some five years earlier with Prince Albert at his apogee. But by 1861, the Queen was suffering from a depression from the combined loss of the removal of her eldest daughter, Victoria, to Prussia through marriage, an assassination attempt on her own life, and the death of her mother, which forced Albert, who was suffering under his own physical ailments, to assume most of her duties, leaving no time for him to engage in peripheral issues such as the design of a building. Palmerson won what was referred to as the Battle of the Styles. Scott's best building, in my opinion, is the Midland Grand Hotel, for which he won the competition in 1865. By 1860, the Midland Railroad needed its own terminal in London. It purchased property and erected the longest clear span structure at the time, 245 feet by 680 feet long, designed by engineer William H. Barlow. The clear span wrought iron trusses made it easy to avoid problems with the planned beer house underneath the tracks that was made possible due to the elevational slope from back to front. Barlow used a pointed arch to reduce thrust that also gave the shed a fashionable Gothic profile. The arch spanned from the ground, not from the top of the walls, for they carried too much load. Therefore, the walls are only screens. Its concept was used for many railroad stations, a large glass and iron train shed that the trains could pull into, fronted by a station, and sometimes combined with a hotel. In British models, there is usually no formal relationship between the hotel station and the shed at all. You have no sense that there is this huge glass and iron structure behind, whereas with the French architects, they will typically express what is behind the station. What I am interested in showing here is this high Victorian Gothic building with its horizontal layers and Gothic detailing, such as these crockets, finials, and spires. Even the interior of this lounge has a direct quote from the Doge's Palace in Venice. Scott employed Owen Jones's polychromed exposed cast iron structure. The only difference being Scott would be inspired by old Gothic details. Whereas Jones always strove for new ahistoric patterns. Curiously, in some ways, the most Ruskinian Gothic building may be this building in the United States, the National Academy of Design in New York City, designed by architect Peter B. White, because you can see how closely he has been influenced in its overall design by the Doge's Palace. White and this building will be critical to our understanding of Chicago architecture in the 1880s, so put this on the back burner because we will examine how an American architect became one of Ruskin's most devoted followers in a couple of lectures from now.